you want to know what the French Revolution was all about, it's this. The people of France wanted an equal seat at the table of power, and the symbol of that power is this head right here. This is an important head. You got to know this head, and I'm going to tell you all about so it. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked guillotine style, then let's get to it. Now, when I say the people of France, I don't mean all the people of France. I'm talking about the average French citizen. Like, if you were among the 97% of French people in the 18th century who were not the king or part of the nobility or the clergy, then your life was not going to be easy, nor was it going to be just. Moreover, you would have had precisely zero power to change your circumstances because all the power for political change was held by those other groups I just mentioned. Now, it had been this way for centuries, but during this period, several factors are going to converge and rouse the people to claim their rightful seat at the table of power. First were economic crises. Remember our boy Louis XIV fought nearly endless wars to establish his dominance on the continent, but those wars were expensive and plunged France deep into debt. And you would think that since all of France would potentially benefit from Louis's territorial expansion, that everyone would shoulder the cost of those wars. But here's where I tell you, you so crazy. No, the nobles and the clergy were exempted from these taxes, and that meant that the entire economic burden of Louis's wars fell on the shoulders of the commoners. So the very people who could afford to have their taxes raised were exempt, and the people who struggled just to get the next meal in their bellies were saddled with new taxes. And the worst part? The people could do precisely nothing about it. And why is that? So glad you asked, because that leads us to the second cause of the French Revolution. The second cause was the imbalance of the Estates General. Now, the Estates General was a representative body of France who was made up of three estates states, the clergy, the nobility, and then everyone else. Under the growing pressure of France's economic crisis, Louis XVI called the Estates General into session to approve an increase in taxes. And you might be wondering, wasn't this during the age of absolute monarchs? Like, why didn't Louis just say, everybody's getting taxed, and if you don't like it, you can kiss my croissant? Well, as it turns out, Louis was a timid kind of guy, and the nobles and the clergy asserted their power and weakened the monarchy. So when Louis did try to impose new taxes by his own authority, the noble judges of the Parlement of Paris shut him down. So Louis was forced to call this body the Estates General into session to get approval for new taxes. Okay, but here's the imbalance that I was talking about. The Estates General, as I said, was made up of France's three estates. The first estate, the Catholic clergy, made up about 1% of the population. The second estate, the nobility, made up about 2% of the population. And then the third estate represented everyone else in the whole of France. But within the Estates General, each estate only got one vote. And since the first and second estates had similar interests, they always voted together. So get this right, 3% of the population decided how life would go for the other 97%. So the people wanted a place at the table of power, and the Estates General prevented them from that. And the third immediate cause of the French Revolution was bread shortages. If it wasn't bad enough that the people of France were bowed down under the weight of unfair tax policies, and they had no power in the Estates General to fix it, now, by 1788, famines had made bread scarce, and a large bulk of the French lower classes were suffering hunger and want. Now, in 1789, the Estates General met to solve these crises, and the first and second estates made it clear that they would do nothing to solve these problems unless it was in their own interest. After all, they're the ones who had all the power at the table, and they weren't eager to give it over to the rabble in the Third Estate. And so, seeing that their cause was futile, members of the Third Estate stood up, left the meeting, and in an act of unprecedented chutzpah, declared themselves to be the one true representative body of France, and they named themselves the National Assembly. And their first order of business was to grant themselves the power over taxation in France. So hey, victory for the people, right? They got their place at the table of power. Well, not really. In June 1789, the representatives of the Third Estate tried to enter another meeting of the Estates General, and were barred from getting in. So they went to a nearby tennis court and swore the tennis court oath by which they promised not to leave that place until they had drafted a new constitution for France. When they had finally completed it, Louis XVI was forced to accept this new limitation on its power, but was secretly assembling French troops to crush the assembly. And once this plot was discovered, a rebel group known as the sans culottes stormed the Bastille, which was a prison that symbolized the tyranny of the king. And this event was the first real uprising of the French Revolution. The people had their place at the table of power, and they refused to let it go. So now the French Revolution has properly started, and you should know that traditionally we talk about two phases of the revolution. First is the liberal phase. During this phase, the National Assembly drafted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which provided for freedom of speech, a representative government, which is to say, a constitutional monarchy, and maybe most significant of all, abolished hereditary privileges of the first and second estates. And not to brag or anything, but you should know that this document was deeply inspired by the American Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, so, you know... <laughs> America. Anyway, the National Assembly also nationalized the Catholic Church. In passing the civil constitution of the clergy in 1790, the Assembly disbanded the Church's monastic orders, confiscated Church lands, eliminated the tithe, which was a tax the peasants had to pay to the Church, and clergy were placed under the authority of the state. Now, during the liberal phase, women played a big role as well, specifically in the October March on Versailles in 1789. Now, remember that bread was scarce during this time, and so whipped into a fury by the extravagant excesses of Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette, thousands of women marched 
marched in the pouring rain to Versailles and demanded that the king and his wife give them all the bread that they were hoarding within the palace walls. Now, of course, they did not do that, and so the women stormed the palace and in doing so killed several guards and put their heads on pikes. And that's where the old French saying comes from, if you mess with a woman's bread, She'll cut off your head. Anyway, the women forced the king to accept the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens, and they would have killed him if it weren't for the intervention of everyone's favorite fighting Frenchman, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, what's kind of astonishing is that these women did all of this despite the fact that women's rights were not even represented in the Declaration. Later, Olympe de Gouges would craft the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen, which would articulate and fight for the rights of women in France. And due to her work, along with other women's groups at the time, the legal status of women improved. But eventually, much of this would be overturned, and citizenship would be restricted to men. So the people are very much getting their place at the table of power. But now we get to the radical phase of the revolution, and the people are gonna get a little drunk in that power. Now, by 1790, the National Assembly had broken into factions, the most radical of which were the Jacobins. In 1792, the National Assembly voted to dissolve itself and create a more permanent parliament called the National Convention. And the Jacobins were able to seize control of the convention and implemented a more radical set of policies. First, they fundamentally reordered time by declaring that year one was no longer the year of Christ's birth, but rather 1792, which they called the era of liberty. Second, they dissolved the constitutional monarchy which had been established by the National Assembly. And they decided to punt the king and declare France a true republic. Now, when I say punted the king, that's just another way of saying he went ahead and got his head cut off. That's the head, people. That's the head you gotta know. What you're seeing here is the people of France holding up the head of King Louis XVI. And so the monarchy was done and the people reigned supreme. But unfortunately for the Jacobins, that's not where the story ends. Other European states who happened to like the system of monarchy were truly horrified by the people beheading their king. After all, if the French cut off their king's head, what would stop our people from cutting off our heads. And so some of these surrounding states allied against France. And in the face of this crisis, the Jacobins and the more moderate members of the National Convention could not agree on a solution. And so with the fractures of their movement beginning to show and fearing that the gains of the revolution were at risk, the Jacobin-dominated convention clamped down hard on any dissent from the French population. And this phase of the revolution became known as the Reign of Terror. Now, the leader to associate with the Reign of Terror is radical Jacobin Maximilien de Robespierre. As it turns out, Robespierre was a fan of cutting off heads because under his leadership, over 40,000 people were put to death at the guillotine by a group that he established called the Committee of Public Safety. Now, to accomplish this kind of control and in order to protect France from the enemy states that had threatened the revolution, they built the largest army Europe had ever seen through mass conscription. Any man 18 to 25 was required to serve in the army. And not only was this army charged with protecting the revolution at home, but also to spread those ideals to surrounding Europe. Now, eventually the reign of terror became so brutal and the committee was acting like such an authoritarian turd that some detractors of the committee itself began to challenge its actions. Like this whole revolution was fought to give people an equal place at the table of power and we've got 40,000 heads and baskets all over France. And so these challengers themselves put an end to the reign of terror, which was accomplished by putting Robespierre himself in the guillotine in 1794. Now you can click right here for the next video in Unit 5, which is going to explore the effects of the French Revolution. And if you want to send me the signal to keep making these videos, then by all means subscribe and I will surely oblige. I'm Lerout.